the typical lecture series that we have at RICE are uh, academics talking to other academics. But we have decided uh, a few months ago that partly there is a, an effort to diversi diversify the Houston economy. And the people talk about Innovation Hub, and uh, you might have the Innovation District. And so we decided to broaden the kind of lectures that we're bringing into RICE and bringing people who, with the RICE connection, but was also with deep connection to the entrepreneurships. And uh, we're doing this lecture series together with the, with the Lilly Center for Entrepreneurship. And we kind of went around and we wanted someone very special, very, very special for the first lecture. And we could not have done better than Jan David Ehrlich, who received his degree from Rice, post bachelor in CS and NEC. And yeah. Then went to work for industry, went back and did his MBA at Stanford, went to Google, and then he jumped off the ledge and started starting companies and investing. He's become a serial investor, a serial entrepreneur. And today he's going to tell us all about it. What does it take to do? So let's welcome Jan David Erl. Thanks, Moshe. I really appreciate it. The topic it. is how to build a vibrant entrepreneurial ecosystem. Big, big ambitious goal. Yeah, we'll, we'll Go see. Thank you. So. Th thanks, Moshe. Thanks, Jan. Uh, thanks, everyone, to, for, for having me here. Um, so yeah, so I was, uh, I was asked to come here and talk about how to build a vibrant entrepreneurial ecosystem. Uh, I'm not an expert. I'm not an academic. So I'll, I'll just caveat that up front. Um, so here, let me see if I can. Oh, OK. So the, the, the real talk is Silicon Valley shouldn't have all the fun. Um, so let's, let's do a quick overview uh, in three parts. So first, we're going to answer, why am I here? You, you may be asking yourself that question. I'm, I'm going to answer it for, for myself. Uh, then we're going to talk a little bit about what the experts say, because there, there are experts that talk about how to build a vibrant entrepreneurial ecosystem. And uh, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm not one of them. Uh, and then, because I'm an entrepreneur and I like to think about building things from first principles, we're going to think about how to build a vibrant entrepreneurial ecosystem from first principles, which is just a fancy word for uh, extrapolating it from my personal experience. <laughs> so statistical sample set of one, very accurate, you know, hi highly unacademic in nature. Please, please enjoy, all right? Uh, all right, so why am I here? Uh, so so my, um, the start of my career looks like what my parents were proud of. Uh, I came to Rice. I did a double bachelor's in computer science and electrical engineering. Uh, I graduated, and to my parents' dismay, and which they still remind me, I, I did not go get a PhD, though according to my dad at age 40, there's still time. Um, uh, but I went to Microsoft. Uh, I studied software engineering, or I practiced software engineering for a couple of years, and then realized that uh, although I enjoyed uh, thinking about how machines worked, uh, I was more fascinated with thinking about how people who make machines operate work, and so I switched into product management. Uh, that led into uh, a, a business school degree at Stanford, uh, which then led into a, a career at Google as a product manager working on a number of products. And my parents are super proud of this up until you know this, this rail, uh, but it wouldn't make for an interesting conversation with all of y'all because I would have nothing to say about how to build a vibrant entrepreneurial ecosystem. Uh, but what I did next, terrified my folks, uh, is I went off and did this. Um, so in 2007, uh, and I'll show you some funny photos of 2007, when Google was on the cover of magazines as the best company to work for, bar none, I left. Uh, and I started a two-person startup called Mogad, <laughs> which sounds like an ominous character from Lord of the Rings. Uh, that did not help us get customers. Uh, but anyway, so I did that. Uh, I ran that business for about 18 months with a, a partner, uh, made every mistake conceivable and imaginable in the book, uh, having left Google where you could build a product and release it and people would come and use that product. We thought the same would work. We built a product and released it and heard crickets. Um, where uh, you know, we were surrounded by really smart people at Google, and we never saw anybody ever get fired. So we just hired willy-nilly and never, hi never fired anybody, which created a horrible company culture. Um, I mean, the list is endless, basically. Made every mistake, every, every uh, 
two, two young uh, entrepreneurs could make. Um, and that business basically failed. We managed to sell the technology uh, for a bag of chips, essentially. Uh, but the business essentially failed. But I was hooked. Uh, I basically found my calling. I, I looked back at my previous career working at these like marquee technology companies, and I was like, man, this doesn't compare to this startup stuff, which almost gave my dad a heart attack. Um, so I went off and did um, an entrepreneur in residence program at a Silicon Valley venture firm, which is essentially you get paid to think. It's pretty awesome. It's kind of like a professorship without any of the rigorous academic requirements. Right? Um, and it only lasts three months, so yeah, I guess maybe not as cool. But, uh, and then out of that, I started my second business, Choice Vendor. Uh, tried to not make the same mistakes as we'd made at MoGAD, so instead made new mistakes. Um, uh, but managed to actually build that business to be somewhat interesting. Uh, and sold it to LinkedIn in September of 2010 prior to LinkedIn's IPO. Uh, and the story would be somewhat interesting if it ended there and I just stayed at LinkedIn and ran a group there, et cetera. But entrepreneurship is a sickness, uh, which I'll describe a little bit later. Uh, it's an affliction. And so I succumbed to the affliction and uh, left LinkedIn and started more businesses. Um, I'll explain why this branches in a second. But um, my third business was a business called Happiness Engines. I partnered with a few friends to start it. It was an abject and complete failure. We raised uh, a little over half a million dollars from investors, including my favorite investor in Silicon Valley ever. Shout out to Michael Deering. He's the nicest guy on the face of the planet. And we lost every last penny of it. The business pivoted four times. We tried everything from AI-driven sales assistance to coloring apps. I mean, it was just like we were all over the map, head on a swivel, uh, and the business like crashed in a blaze of fury after the end of two years of ex rapid experimentation. Um, and uh, my, my deepest regret still in the spheres of entrepreneurship is, you know, investors invest expecting to lose money, but he, Michael is like the last person I want to lose money for, so. Oh well, but as that business, um, was crashing and burning, uh, I teamed up with uh, a, a couple of colleagues that I'd known from Stanford days, uh, and we started a company that is now called Parsable. Back then it was called Wearable Intelligence because I'm horrible at naming businesses. Um, and over the course of the last five years, we grew that business to about 100 employees, um, about a little over 10 million in, in annual revenue, uh, and uh, marquee customers from across the globe, including Schlumberger, Corteva, uh, and a, a bunch of others. Uh, I ran that business as CEO for about five years and then stepped down in September uh, to focus on my other passion, which is why this thing branches. Um, and the other, the other reason I am here to talk about how to build a vibrant entrepreneurial ecosystem is I made a little bit of money from Choice Vendor um, not enough money to build a moon base, otherwise we would be having this conversation on the moon. Um, but enough that I could do something with it. And uh, instead of buying fancy cars or a home or trips or something like that, um, I was fortunate enough to get the opportunity to reinvest that money into my friends' companies. Uh, and I was lucky enough that I have really smart friends. So my first investment was in a company called GeoAPI that sold to Twitter about a year after I invested. Uh, my second uh, was in a company called Thumbtack that is still operating today. And that created an opportunity for me to create a, an accelerator in, in Los Angeles and start uh, an entrepreneurial ecosystem there. And so there's, there'll hopefully be some transferable learnings. Um, and then continue and, and eventually lead uh, to my current gig as a venture capitalist. Uh, so, so let's kind of like zoom out for a second and, and just think about this for a sec. And if you, if you look at it functionally, um, you can think about, well, I started as a technologist, and I became a product person, became an entrepreneur, and then over time became an, an entrepreneur and investor. That's interesting, but doesn't tell us much. Um, this is a better analysis, right? It's a path of knowing less and less about more and more until I know absolutely nothing about everything. It's the, the generalist's path, uh, as opposed to the specialist who knows more and more about less and less until they know absolutely everything about nothing, right? So, um, 
But the way that I like to think about this um, is as an iterative loop, and I, you'll, you'll see this, I like iterative loops. I think entrepreneurs in general like iterative loops, computer scientists also, uh, is I took a job, I got somewhat good at it, and then I would move into a job that would help me enable the previous job. So like do job A, get good, pick a job B that helps make the life of people who have job A better, right? So product manager, a good product manager makes the life of a software engineer better. Good entrepreneur makes the life of product managers better. Good investor, hopefully, fingers crossed, makes the life of entrepreneurs better. And I think about these things in kind of these self-optimizing systems, and that'll come back as I think about um, building an entrepreneurial ecosystem. All right, so that's me. So that's a little bit of context. More stories coming. But. All right, uh, and then you know what happens next? Like who knows, right? So that's the the joy of it. All right, so what do the experts say? So there are tons of books on how to build a vibrant entrepreneurial ecosystem. These books will put you in a coma if you try to read them. Uh, so I have, so you don't have to. Uh, and the cliff notes to all these books are as follows: uh, In order to build a vibrant entrepreneurial ecosystem, you need the convergence of academia, private sector, and government, all investing in a small geographic area. Uh, you need high density of wealthy investors. You can invest in the aforementioned startups. You need cheap land and living affordances. And if any of you know Silicon Valley, this is a giant freaking joke uh, because none of those things are true. But they were probably true in the 60s or 50s or 1900s. Early 70s at the latest, exactly. Um, uh, you need inspiration from past success stories, so people could be like, I want to be like that guy or gal when I, when I grow up, which is useful. Uh, you need level-headed approach to failure, even admiration of failure. And this is actually one of the places where most places go wrong. Uh, you need to look at failure as something to be admired and respected. Uh, you need a high density of immigrants. So you know, whichever way you stand in the political climate at this point, this has been a, a proven uh, ingredient for building a, a successful entrepreneurial ecosystem. Uh, you need a risk-taking meritocratic culture, uh, and you need policies that make it easy to start a business, which generally in the U.S. are kind of like federal policies, that's fine, but there are other countries that wonder why they don't have entrepreneurship, and then when you try to start a business, they hand you like a book this big to fill out and you answer that question. And these are all true, and I really hate this explanation. And the reason I hate this explanation is because it's a steady state answer and not a start answer. So it's kind of the equivalent of saying, oh, you want to build a competitor to Facebook? First, get a billion users. Turns out that's hard, and people forget that Facebook doesn't or didn't look like this at the beginning, look like this. This is my Facebook profile. This is not my Facebook profile, just FYI, parents watching on the video. Uh, but people forget that the, the start of things don't look like things at scale. And this is actually a, a mistake entrepreneurs make. I've made that mistake in my startups. Uh, and it's a mistake that as you start something new, to assume that you can basically go straight to the scale solution is like the, the death knell for many projects. So. Let's start from extrapolating from personal stories. Um, so if you want to build a company, and I would claim here, let's just assume a vibrant entrepreneurial ecosystem is an engine, right? As a, so you can, you can treat it like a startup. If you want to build a startup, you've got to ask yourself a couple questions. Who's my customer? What are their pains? How do I satisfy their pains? Most importantly, how do I satisfy the pains for like the first hundred of them? Like, screw this works forever, right? Like, let's start in a small group. Uh, and, I, and I think about this in, in the context of building an entrepreneurial ecosystem. I think the, the hidden question inside the question is, how do we build it for Houston? And what I'd like to answer is, how do we build it for this room first? Because what you want to do is you want to build it for one room, then you want to build it for five rooms, and you want to build it for 50 rooms. Eventually, it's the size of Houston. But if you try to tackle the size of Houston first, you are going to fail because there is no way you get something at scale without starting small. Once you have it small, you build it at scale. Uh, and then, this is also like a, one of these questions that people like 
ask way too early is what do I do about my competitors? And it turns out, in most small startups, your biggest competitor is people not giving a shit about your solution, not some other real competitor. <laughs> like, apathy is your biggest competitor. <laughs> Don't compete against Silicon Valley, compete against people not caring. But once you get large enough, then your competitor actually matters because you know, you're really actually competing for the incremental resource as opposed to like getting any resources. All right, so let's start. So who's your customer? Turns out this is a little complex. You know, ideally, if you build a startup, you want one customer. This is going to suck because we have three. Uh, entrepreneurs, people who start the businesses. Early employees slash co-founders, the people who join those businesses when they are still risky, right, before they look proven. Uh, and risk sources of risk capital, people who, who spend money basically ensuring that those businesses exist, again, while they're still risky. So let's tackle these one by one. What are the needs of entrepreneurs? All right. So yeah, so that's one of them. All right, so the, the way I'm going to talk about these is I'm going to talk about this guy. Um, so, so this is me in 2007. I think you can see it on the stock cert. Um, this was the cover of Fortune that month. I know because my dad sent it to me when I left Google. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, and what was going through my head when I left Google to start MoGAD Inc. with my, my buddy Lucas was, am I crazy to do this? Right? I'd never started a company before. My parents had never started a company before. Their parents had never started a company before. No idea what I was doing. I knew that I kind of wanted to try, but like, what, what did that mean? What happens when this fails? Not if this fails, when this fails, right? First time, likely it's going to be a disaster. Am I never going to be able to get a job? Are people going to look at me and be like, ugh, it's that guy with that MOGAD startup, you know? Uh, how do you do this? Like, what does it mean? Like, great, I've, I've self-titled myself, I've knighted myself CEO of a company of two people. What does it mean to be the CEO? I've never been a CEO before. Everybody says product managers are mini CEOs of mini businesses. What the hell does that even mean? And how does that scale to like a real business? Like, what do I have to do every day to make this thing successful? Uh, I can't do this alone. Like terror, right? And even Lucas, I was like, great, I got Lucas. I got one guy. And like, then we looked at each other. We're like, we can't do this alone. What do we do? How do you hire people? How do you convince people to join you on this crazy journey? Considering you've just asked yourself the three bulleted questions above. Right? Um, who's going to buy or use this thing? You know, we tried. We launched this thing. There was crickets. We're like, how does this work? How do you get people to care? Um, and uh, who's nuts enough to give me money? Because we're going to need money to hire these crazy people, and we're going to need money to buy servers and, and all that stuff. Who's, who's going to give us that money? And I'll tell you a funny story there. We were asking ourselves, vocalizing this last question. Um, in person at a coffee shop, Koopa Cafe in Palo Alto. Lucas and I sitting there over our, our black coffees, um, literally saying, like, who the hell is going to be crazy enough to, to give us money? And uh, this gentleman walked up to our table, and he was like, um, I, excuse me, I've overheard your conversation. Uh, I'm an angel investor, and I would like to invest in your business. And we were like, we don't even know what the business is. And he's like, it doesn't matter. You guys seem really smart. You know, we, you, you like, I've heard, I heard the rest of your conversation. You guys seem like you, you know what you're talking about. So I will, I will give you money. <laughs> and we just looked at each other. We're like, this is crazy. And he did. He invested. And not only did he invest, he, hel he actually helped find other investors for the business. That's how he, how he got started. Um, but yeah, so here's my list. Yeah, Koopa Cafe, you can go hang out there. It actually still is. Like you, you, if you hang out at Koopa Cafe and you're looking for money, just pretend you're starting a business and somebody will walk up to you. That person might be me uh, and offer to give you capital. Uh, but serendipity is actually one of the things, so I'll, we'll, we'll bring that up. But. All right, so, so what are the needs of founders and, and early employees? Um, so um, I'm going to answer that question with another terrible personal story. And I'm going to talk about this guy. Uh, so this is my buddy Rama. Uh, he was my co-founder uh, of my second business, Choice Vendor, the one we sold to LinkedIn. Uh, we're still very good friends. 
uh, and I pulled him out of Google uh, to do this business. So I, I sold Mogad um, and uh, was doing my EIR at, uh, at Battery Ventures. Um, and I came up with this idea, I was pretty excited about it, to build a marketplace for ratings and reviews for businesses. So think Yelp or Angie's List, but if the reader of a review is another business as opposed to a consumer, so I want to find a, an attorney or a marketing vendor, or et cetera. And we're like, great, this is a search problem. Let's pull a great search guy out of Google. And I was like, wow, oh, my buddy Rama, he's awesome. And so brought him in, started selling him, and you know, the stuff that were, was going through his head were, I'm a good friend, but am I crazy to do this? What happens when this fails? Yonda's last startup didn't do super hot, so, you know, I don't know, pretty risky. Um, is this the idea to leave Google for? Like, yeah, I'm not gonna stay at Google forever, entrepreneurial aspirations, but like, is this the one? How do I judge? You know, is this the, is this the idea? Is there another idea? Is there, you know, what, what's around the corner? Uh, how does one do this? You are now anointed to be the founding CTO of a startup. Never been a CTO before. How do you do the job? Um, and will it be worth it, right? Ultimately, I'm giving up this crazy high salary at Google for a lot less cash comp and a lot of equity in a business that could be worth a lot or nothing. How do I choose? And then finally, what are the needs of risk capital, VCs and, VCs and angels? Uh, and I'll, I don't know if you recognize these two guys. Founders of Thumbtack. So Thumbtack is today a brand. It's a billion dollar plus valued business. Um, it's a marketplace that you know millions of people transact on every day to find vendors and service providers of, of any of any kind. And I was fortunate enough that Jonathan, the gentleman on your left, is the younger brother of a buddy of mine, Todd. Uh, and Todd sends me this email in 2009, and he says, "Listen." Uh, my younger brother, Jonathan, is thinking of, he's, got, he's gotten accepted into Stanford Business School, and um, he's thinking of like not accepting it and instead starting this like startup. And could you get on the phone with him and, and tell him that's a terrible idea? <laughs> uh, Todd and I went to business school together. Right? So, so I, I, get on the phone with Jonathan, uh, I get on the phone with Jonathan, and I'm telling you know, tell me your story, and he tells me this thing. And, uh, and I'm like, yeah, listen, like this is, this is pretty cool. Like, I, I think, I think you should, you know, like, I don't want to, you know, your brother's going to hate me forever, but I think you should do this. It's, it's a, it's an interesting idea. And um, I hang up the phone, call Todd. I'm like, hey, sorry, you know, like, seems like he's really passionate about it. You should go do this. Um, a couple weeks later, Marco, the gentleman on the right, is the son of the. I don't even know how to do this. My buddy's father's business partner's son. No relation, basically. But anyway, my, my buddy calls me, and he's like, hey, I've got this smart kid. He's the son of my dad's business partner. Thinking about starting this crazy business. Could you tell me if it's like a good idea? We like, might put, like, I might write a small check into it, because it's my dad's business partner's son. So I get on the phone, talk to this kid, Marco. He's talking about this business. I'm like, shit, I've heard this business before. Uh, and he's like, yeah, I'm starting this thing called Thumbtack. And I'm like, with Jonathan? And he's like, yeah, it was amazing. He's like, so he's like, oh, wow, you, you, know, you know Silicon Valley. You've talked to my co-founder before I knew. Why don't you come and, um, and advise us? Uh, and so I head over there uh, in this house in, uh, in San Francisco. And uh, I walk in, and I, I don't see this. I see this. Yeah. Right, and so I had a cogent conversation with two young entrepreneurial gentlemen on the phone, and the thoughts going through my head, and I apologize for the, the gritty picture, we, we did not have high megapixel, high megapixel cameras back then, uh, is uh, what happens after I lose my money? <laughs> because not a lot of uh, confidence inspiration there, right? Uh, how does one invest in startups? Right? They're, 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 they're giving me the opportunity uh, to come invest in their business. What does that mean? What should I care about? How do I help? Is this like buying something? Like how does, that, how does this work? Right? Um, are these the founders to bet on? Like I have a little bit of money in my bank account from the choice vendor thing. It's not like I'm gonna invest in like a thousand businesses. It's gonna be a handful of them. 
Is this one of the handful? Is this the idea to bet on? Does that even matter? Like they, you know, they had an idea, but there was nothing built when I showed up. They were just like hanging out on this couch, most of them not wearing any socks. Um, and then, you know, are they going to spend all my money? Like, like, how are they going to be good stewards of capital? What does it even mean? Like, are they just going to buy a bunch of socks? Is that going to be it? Like, I don't really know. All right, so quick recap, right? So one of the things that we start thinking about is as we build the solution, right, for these three sets of stakeholders, it's kind of nice that all three sets of stakeholders kind of need the same stuff, right? So if you go back, entrepreneurs, early employees, and angels and VCs in a nascent economy need advice and mentorship. They need to know, are they doing it right? How does one do it, right? Uh, they also all need emotional support and community, and this cannot be stressed enough. Like, they really want to know, am I alone and am I crazy? I know I felt those at every stage of my life in entrepreneurship. And then the third thing, which we, we talked about where, where many people fail, is you, you need to minimize the fear of failure or have some kind of acceptance of failure. So, Failing cannot be an end state. It has to be like a transitional path. It's almost like expected that at some point you're going to fail. Then it gets a little bit tough, right? So the green stuff's good because you can just like find solutions to these and then just like recycle them for everyone in some slight variance. The red stuff or yellow, orange, whatever, is harder because these are vicious cycles, right? So entrepreneurs need co-founders and employees, but co-founders and employees need founders and you kind of need to get everybody in the same room at the same time, otherwise, you know, you got to kickstart the flywheel in some way, and you can't just collect one of these customers, make a great experience for them, and be done. So, how does one do this? Let me tell you another personal story. <laughs> um, so, I'll, I'll give you a statistical sample set of one, um, and then we'll discuss whether it applies. So, in 2011, uh, three friends and I started a venture accelerator in Los Angeles. Um, it was called Mucker Lab. And we followed a fairly thoughtful, we thought, recipe for how to bootstrap this. And just to give you a, a little bit of a sense, uh, in 2011, um, Los Angeles was not a very vibrant entrepreneurial ecosystem. There were a couple of other accelerators that most people didn't apply to. There were a handful of startups that were fairly spread out across the LA region. And if you know LA traffic, even if things are a mile away, it takes an hour. If they're like on the upside sides of LA, it's as if they were in different countries. Um, and that's what it looked like. And so you had four transplants from Silicon Valley decide to move down to LA and take a crack at this. Uh, one of us, Eric, was a former VC, and the other three were current or former entrepreneurs. And the first thing we did is we went and collected as many mentors as humanly possible. And if you remember the slide before, what everybody needs is mentorship. Everybody wants mentorship. Everybody wants some guidance. And so the first thing we did is we went and got like a ton of mentors. And by ton, I really mean a ton of mentors. And the nice thing about collecting mentors is that they don't actually necessarily all need to live in LA. Uh, they can be all over the place. Many of them were in San Francisco, some of them were in other parts of the world, but they all had an affinity and an affiliation with LA. And so that was kind of our claim to fame. We went and collected a bunch of people who cared that an entrepreneurial ecosystem would be built in LA, and as a result, were willing to mentor other VCs, prospective entrepreneurs, et cetera. We then used this giant list of mentors to trawl for the best entrepreneurs that we could. Uh, and we went far and wide. We got recommendations from mentors. We got recommendations from our own network. We posted an open application process. We got a bunch of people to apply whichever way humanly possible so we could create a giant list and pick the best ones out of them. And once we had this massive list, we picked only 12 companies. And so we kept our bar very high because first impressions matter when you try to get a flywheel started. So how do you build it? And we made those 12 companies suffer. Uh, we made them work in this really dingy space. This is like the office right here. Uh, the golf store was there. Occasionally you would hear thunk 
because you know people were hitting golf balls inside the thing and it would hit against a wall. Uh, on the other side, which Google Maps doesn't show, is a like a B-rated kind of talent agency. So we would drive up and people would be wearing like cowboy hats or space suits or you know all kinds of weird moody shit. And every time the entrepreneurs would be like, well, they seem to be having more fun than us. We're just like working constantly uh, while they're auditioning to be spacemen or something in really bad movies. Uh, we made people work side by side in these like kind of dingy space. This is the whole space, by the way. Like that's it. You know, like people just like long row, a couple conference rooms behind that like fake metal, mostly kind of corrugated plastic structure, um, and people just like worked there day and night constantly. Uh, and the reason we wanted to make people work like this is that you actually build a lot of context if you work side by side with people through trials and tribulations. This is like a good psychological experiment. You want people to bond, make them do something horrible together. They're going to be friends. And what that established is scale, because there were only four of us. And even though we only got 12 startups, there's still you know, 30 plus people. Uh, and so we wanted them to help each other. Uh, one of the things that we forced the mentors to do is they had to come and speak. So it didn't matter that you weren't from LA, but once a year you had to come and talk to the class. And so this is one of them, like having a pre, a prep conversation. So you would come to the class, you would speak, and this enabled people to have actually like human connections with the, the students, well like with the, with the, uh, the, the budding entrepreneurs. Um, you had to be accepting a failure and I'm going to pick on my good friend Matt's startup. Um, so uh, Matt uh, joined Mucker uh, with a mission to build a tool that helped people match to their best universities. And we accepted him. He seemed smart. His co-founder seemed smart. The idea seemed pretty cool. They had raised a little bit of money even prior to entering Mucker from com like funds that were focused on education. And about three weeks uh, into the, 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 the accelerator class, the business just completely imploded. Uh, couldn't get any customers, nobody cared. Turns out this is one of these problems that like, people solve some other way by hiring like, expensive consultants. Nobody wanted to go to a website, et cetera. And so Matt and his co-founders were like, what do we do? Are we booted out? You know, our startup didn't work. And we're like, no, this is totally normal, in front of everybody, right? This is totally normal. Most startups fail. We brought you into the class because we believe in you guys. So why don't you pick a conference room and find another business that you love? Um, and there was much deliberation. And in the process of that, they realized that they were all photographers and that they had a passion for photography. And uh, they built this, uh, which is a company that helps you sell your Instagram photos as canvas prints. Nothing to do, like literally nothing to do with this, right? And that was amazing. I mean, for one, they, they kind of did this complete pivot. It was successful. They launched. They got investors. Um, but it also set as an example for everybody else in the class that like failure is a, is a thing that you go through, right? Like at some point in your startup, your startup will fail and you have to navigate through it, either through a product pivot or a customer pivot or some strategy. And this is, was like the most flagrant example of this. Like they went from a college prep acceptance thing to a photography site. It worked. And the business actually went on to pivot one more time, even after it graduated from Mucker, and is now a competitor, like a, like a very vibrant competitor to Getty and Shutterstock. So again, like this kind of set up the DNA for them that like Canvas Sprints like kind of worked for a while, and then it stopped working, and they were like, well, we know how to do this. Like, we've done this before. We can do this again. Make some tweaks. Keep going. And that's really how you build a, a muscle for entrepreneurship. And we, we got to kind of foster that and see that happen. And then at the end, um, because you want to create a flywheel, we held a massive demo day. And this is, again, the same dingy space. Just you know, rotate the picture. And we packed this full of investors. And we not only invited investors from LA, but we used our networks in Silicon Valley to basically browbeat investors from Silicon Valley to come. Uh, and so we would invite investors from LA and investors from the community, and we're like, hey, there's going to be people here from Sequoia, and Kleiner, and all these funds you're scared of. 
And if you don't come, they're going to get all the best deals. And so the room was packed. And because the room was packed, people were like, hey, you, know, you went to that mucker thing. Oh, yeah, those are good companies. Yeah. And like, there's a bunch of other investors that are doing investing things. It's not crazy to be an investor in startups in LA. Look, there's all these people in this room that are doing it. right? And so you basically bootstrap this social proof. You, you answer the, am I alone? Nope. Am I crazy? Well, either we're all crazy or I'm not crazy. Cool. I'll invest. And that's basically what happened. Um, so quick recap of the recipe, right? Get as many mentors as you can. Use the mentors to trawl for startups. Get a really high bar. Put the founders in a dingy space. So again, think about this. Not at city scale, but at room scale, dingy room scale, right? Uh, make them work really hard together for a long time. Force the mentors to come. Encourage failure. Have a massive demo day. Repeat. Um, and in the case of Mucker, it worked. So we ran eight batches like this. Then we moved to a continuous mode where people could just like sign up, come. You know, like it became its own thing, right? We no longer had to run it like a class. It just became a, a space where people came to run startups. Uh, hundreds of startups have graduated since 2011 when we started this thing. Top Silicon Valley VCs now actually like of their own volition as opposed to being like browbeaten go to LA to prospect for deals. They come to Mucker to meet companies. Um, and most of the companies stay in LA. Some of them move to other places, uh, but most of them have, have stayed. And the beauty of this is we place it in Santa Monica and now there's a bunch of companies that are all next to each other. And so entrepreneurs run into each other in the street coffee shops, restaurants, and reinforce that this is not like I'm all alone in Los Angeles doing this stuff because they're in close quarters, which is really, really important. Will this work for you? AKA, will it work for Houston? Um, I have no idea. <laughs> but it doesn't seem unreasonable that it could. right? Does it work at scale? This is like the age-old gnomes question. Who knows? You have to start with phase one. You can't get to phase two without starting with phase one. Um, and how do you compete against other regions? Right? Like, suppose you get this at scale. How do you go from there? So I think the subtle question, again, is underneath this is, can Houston replace Silicon Valley? And the answer is no. But Houston has a unique set of customers that you can't find anywhere else in the world. There's a unique love for the city and the republic. <laughs> uh, there's a strong entrepreneurial spirit. It hasn't necessarily always been just in tech, but the city has a vibrant entrepreneurial spirit. And entrepreneurship is a sickness, so you can refocus it because people who are ill with entrepreneurship just want to entrepreneur their whole lives. Um, there's at least one good school to train <laughs> founders and early employees. Um, apologies to those who didn't go to Rice. Um, uh, and there's successful alumni uh, who can become mentors and investors. And again, the beauty of mentors is they don't have to live here. They just have to be willing to come once a year. And that ain't that hard. I just did it. Right? Um, that's it. All right, I'll take questions. Yeah. Fire away. I don't know how we, is there a hand mic or something? Oh, I'm mugging them. All right. Um, this is Lisa Lee. I'm currently a master's student at Royce Bar Engineering. And I used to talk to the venture capitals from Boston. Yeah. And asking you, like, why venture capitals are not that active. Hold on, hold on. Yeah. There we go. Ah, oh, fancy microphone. All right, let's do this again. Um, this is Mika Lee. And I'm currently a master's student from Bioengineering Department. I used to talk to the venture capitalists from Boston, asking why the uh, bio is this not as active uh, for venture capitals on um, biotechnology or med tech here in Houston. And they say because there are few resources they could find here in Houston, including like human resource or um, other venture capitals. And all we know about in Houston, probably venture capitals with angels, they focus more on oil and gas. So it's a little bit difficult for us to change the ecosystem currently. 
and entrepreneurs probably left the city because they couldn't find enough fundings here. Yep. So my question will be, how to create an ecosystem for a different field uh, from the original city folks on? Like how to persuade the venture capitals or angels that, oh, you need to switch the channels to MedTech because we have the largest hospital zone here in Houston. Yep. Thank you so much. Yeah, for sure. Um, so just a quick recap is basically like there's a, there's a vibrant ecosystem funding startups that are related to oil and gas. The question is how do you start one for another sector of med tech, which may or may not be vibrant in other parts of the country, but is not as vibrant in Houston. I think the, the answer is going to sound fairly similar to this, which is you know, if, you, um, if you have 20 friends and you invite them to a dinner party, you book, you book a, a room that seats 200 people, or do you book a room that seats like 15 so that the 20 people feel like they're like at the hottest place in the world and it's hard to find a seat, right? And I think I would claim you want to do the latter, not the former. And so again, it's like, don't think about doing this for Houston. Just get all of the startups that are med tech startups, put them in like one little space next to each other and time it so that you get all of the venture capitalists from Boston, from Silicon Valley, from Houston, from whatever, to come see all of those companies at the same time in a, in, a, in a forum where it feels like all of the interesting things that are happening in med in Houston are happening right now. Because the main thing is VCs are really busy, mostly with useless shit, right? Like they're, they're taking meetings, most of their meetings are garbage. I know most of my meetings are garbage. Um, VCs are bad at managing their time because the feedback loop on knowing whether you've done something successful, like a successful investment activity, is years. And so it's hard to kind of get a feedback cycle and like, did I, was this meeting that I just took a, a good meeting? Like I won't really know for a long time. But if you up the value of an incremental minute, it changes my mental calculus, right? If I can meet 20 startups on one day, that's better than meeting one startup, right? And if I'm interested in med tech, and I know that, you know, if, I, if I'm vaguely interested in med tech in Houston, but I know that all the tep, top med tech investors from Boston are gonna be there, Silicon Valley are gonna be there, people are flying in from China and Europe. It's like, crap, can I afford to miss this? Right? And if you, if you do that, and you show up, and it's a good event, that builds its own momentum. The next time people will be like, oh, when are you, when are you doing that again? That was, that was great. And over time, you know, you can expand it from that room to a building to multiple buildings, and then it's just like, hey, come to Houston. There are cool startups in Houston in the space. But I think it's, if you start small and make it work at a small scale, that is the necessary ingredient to, to get the, the system started. Yeah? And, and on the last question, I'm going to let you just focus on entertainment. Mm -mm. Nope. Yeah, we didn't focus on entertainment. We, we focused on getting the best entrepreneurs that we could. Um, some of them were entertained. Some of them were, were related to entertainment, but as you saw, you know, college prep matching startup. Uh, and the, the 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 truth is here, um, you know, entrepreneurs will show you what the future looks like. And so, if you if you cast a wide net for the best entrepreneurs, and then you let them come with their own ideas, and sometimes their first ideas won't work. It'll have to be the second or the third or the tenth idea. Uh, they will guide the, the way. And so we didn't want to unnecessarily restrict, so we had maximum degrees of freedom for the entrepreneurs to show us. So we did say tech, right? So you couldn't come in wanting to start a bagel store or something like that because that doesn't have uh, interesting investable properties for, for investors. And so we were thinking a couple steps ahead where like, you also want to bring all the VCs because they're necessary for the system, and those VCs want to invest in tech companies. But outside of tech, like that was kind of the only restriction. Over time, obviously, most of the businesses uh, that are started in LA benefit like the ones I would expect from, from Houston uh, from the unique properties uh, of, uh, of uh, Los Angeles. And so in as much as there's interesting med and oil and gas and stuff like that in Houston, there's more media startups in LA. And that makes sense because if you have competitive advantages in connections and network and assets, use them. Uh, but to start, it didn't matter because we just needed 12 startups. We didn't need to solve the problem at, at Los Angeles scale. We needed to solve the problem at you know, 901 Colorado scale or whatever the address was for that first dingy office. Yeah. So for, for uh, Mucker to succeed, uh, what was 
Which factor was more important in choosing your physical location? Was it sort of geography among potential customers, or was it just simply cost of rent? Uh, what, what made the biggest difference? Um, rent, parking, relatively easily accessible. People could you know, live nearby or drive there easily and park. Um, it turns out you know, people will go to customers, and so you just want a place where they can come and work when they're not there. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and also like honestly, like we concertedly thought about making it feel crowded because you know if you go to a party and there's only two people in the room, you want to leave. Uh, but if it's crowded, you're like, well, there's probably a reason all these other people are here. We stay, find out. And that builds its own, you know, it, become, it becomes self-fulfilling in, in, in some regards. And so that became important for both the entrepreneurs themselves and the investors. Because, you know, when you, when you apply to join a brand new accelerator, you're like, I don't know, like, am I the only startup that's applying? You know, like, they have an open application process, but am I, am I going to show up and be the only one? And so you showed up, and it was, like, hard to find the way to angle your seat to get enough elbow space. That was good, right? People were like, oh, lots of people applied. I'm smart to have done this, right? And over time, you do become smart to have done this, but it's, you, you're, it's, a, it's a reflexive property, essentially, right? You, it, it becomes that way because everybody there believes it, and that makes it a reality. So. But in Los Angeles, did you try to leverage the, the unique industries of, of the city? Not much. I mean, we di it, it did over time, but at the beginning, uh, again, because we didn't care about Los Angeles. We just cared about this like, small room. Right? And so if you have to invest in thousands of startups in Los Angeles, which we eventually want to do, you have to care about media because more startups and media are going to get started. But if all you have to do is invest in 12 startups, you just pick the 12 best startups you can find. It doesn't matter. Right? And then because those startups were created, the investors come. Because the investors come, more startups want to come. And over time, you build something that resembles the wider ecosystem. But that took six, seven years to, to get to that stage. You can't if you skip steps, you fail, basically. It's yeah, kind of the yeah, thing. Yeah. Like you, it's like a proof. You can't skip too many steps. Tell it to my students. Yeah. <laughs> I've learned that mistake you know, firsthand, by the way. But. So uh, one thing, you know, I noticed that on your timeline, you forgot one company you were involved in starting, and it was connected. Yeah, yeah. Because you were an entrepreneur before you left, right? Yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> I, I just didn't know it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. What? Because it's taken them now it's open stacks and they're sort of successful, but you know, they struggled in the beginning because they were trying to solve, in my opinion, the global problem, not the solution for hundred people. Yeah. Um, I mean I think you know, in in some sense pa path paths for startups are so unique that it's really hard to kind of rewind and think about, you know, what if I'd made a different decision and et cetera, you know, like uh, why, why did Choice Vendor not become Yelp or Angie's List? Or, you know, it's like, who knows, right? Um, I think, you know, if I, I, I have two sample points on, on connections, right? Like, my first one is like 1999 as a student trying to figure out whether we should use XML or LaTeX. And then fast forward 15 years later when it's like a force of nature. And I, I didn't get the, 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 the points in between, so it's hard also for me to opine on it. Um, but I would say it's not unusual for startups to take this long to become successful. Many startups took that long. Like we, the media likes to write about startups that were overnight successes. And so we all think my startup's not an overnight success. It's probably a failure. But it turns out most startups take about 10 years. The, the median time from, from a startup inception to like a, some type of meaningful event, an IPO, an acquisition, a large enough acquisition to matter, it's about 10 years. And so, um, you know, the fact that it took that long is actually like not too unusual. And, and failing is not uh, bad, right? Like, I think in some sense, OpenStax did the right thing, which is it failed, and then it overcome, overcame its failures, kept going, failed again, overcame its failures, kept going, and eventually became something big. The way I would have been sad is if we had not talked about connections at all. Because on the first failure, people are like, ah, this is too fucking hard. Let's go do something else, right? 
But instead, folks who were there kept pushing. And ultimately, that, that for me is like the best example of success. Like you, you have a, a vision for what deserves to exist in the world. Um, obstacles crop up. You know, sometimes it's a wall, sometimes it's a wall like covered in Vaseline that's like extremely slippery with like dragons, you know, whatever, right? And you just find ways around these obstacles and you don't know what the next obstacle is until you've scaled that one. So like all you focus on is the, the wall in front of you. Uh, and over time, you know, you're like out of the dark woods and into the clearing, but sometimes that takes a year, sometimes it takes a decade. And all that matters is just like the, uh, the best uh, quote, like this is one of my favorite entrepreneurial quotes, is if you're going through hell, keep going. Right, there's a Winston Churchill quote. Um, and that's the, you know, the, the, those, are, those are good cases for me. It's like, the back, I don't know, wherever. When you were building the investor ecosystem, you talked a lot about building the entrepreneur side of that and bringing in investors from outside of LA. Yeah. How important is it, do you think, for there to be a native ecosystem of investors? What does it look like in LA today? And were there any things that, that you did to actually start to educate or cultivate uh, potential investors about how to uh, think about putting your money into businesses they may not be as familiar with with the higher risk tolerance, right? You're bringing yep. in digital ventures into uh, a very media-focused area. Here it would be bringing digital or other technologies into uh, an ecosystem that's been focused on other industries like oil and gas, for example. Yeah, for sure. So um, I think... There's usually a network of investors in every city. They just maybe don't invest in startups, right? People at a certain level of excess capital have run out of Ferraris to buy and are looking for other things, right? Uh, the challenge is, are they investing in restaurants? Are they buying property in the you know, Greek coasts, the Greek isles, or are they reinvesting it into the, into the ecosystem? So I think it's less, I think if you, if you really went to a place that had like no wealthy people who wanted to invest in anything, it would actually be fairly hard because you bring all those people. Uh, but I think here in LA, it was more about, there were some people who were investing in tech, not many. Uh, there were a lot of people who were investing, uh, but not necessarily in tech. Um, I think one of the things that's helped over time uh, turn investors from other assets into technology is that technology has become more prevalent in the press, and so these stories of overnight successes, et cetera, are actually helpful in convincing people. Um, and two, honestly, it's hard to find yields everywhere else. And so uh, people are kind of naturally, like they go down their checklist and they're like, well, that real estate property I bought in the Greek Isles, not working out so hot for me, what else can I do to turn my money into more money. And eventually, they're going to realize that like, there's not that many options, and tech is one of the ones that works. Uh, so that, combined with the press, has actually helped. And the, the beauty is the press is also um, elevated to a certain level of status, uh, the Silicon Valley brand name investors, the Sequoias and Benchmarks and et cetera of the world. Right? And so if you tell them those people are going to be here, they're going to be like, hmm. Like that's like suddenly it's the hot party with the bouncer of the you know the light club, um, and and so people come and the first the first way for them to to really know whether to invest or not is is exposure. Um, the second thing is that it, you know it turns out like you can be a very good or or not so good tech investor and there are skills that are learnable etc. But I think the fundamentals of like how to think about whether I want to deploy risk capital or not underneath they're kind of all fairly similar. Uh, and so if you take away the fear that this is a mistake and you add a little bit of FOMO that, you know, if you don't do it, then someone who the media says is really damn smart is going to do it instead, that creates, you know, some pressure. And to be perfectly honest, some of this stuff is also built by being lucky early. So, you know, my first two businesses that I invested in were GeoAPI and Thumbtack. It have, if I had picked two abject failures, I might not be here today, right? Uh, because I would have been like, oh, this is really hard. I suck at it. I'm going to do something else, right? Um, the beauty is there's enough startups that some subset of the investors that, you, that come to your demo day are going to invest in good ones, and then they're going to tell their friends, and it goes on from there. So. Yes. Yeah. So um, my name is Samir Gaibo, and I'm a co-founder of Bitcoin Capital. Um, I'm really interested in this Congratulations.
it's not, and I'm quoting them, which yeah. tells us that they're going to look Yeah. So um, my question is, you know, if we look at other parts of financial markets, and we see this evolution in how much technology has changed, the way business is done, for example, in trading, in equities trading, in uh, mortgages, throughout, uh, what do you think is the next natural evolution of the uh, of this VC-centered um, ecosystem? Or do you think it's going to stay the same in the near future? That's a good question. I mean, I don't have a crystal ball. I, if I did, I would be living on the moon. Um, uh, you know, I, I think there's already one. By the way, the the opinion that you heard from that first, as a on a on a very tactical standpoint, the opinion you heard from that VC, and I'm sure they're very smart. It's just that person's opinion. Uh, and one advice, one piece of advice I give to um, to entrepreneurs when they go out to fundraise, because this is a, a question that comes up, is I tell them you're going to hear a lot of no's. A lot of people are going to say no, and they're going to say no in different ways, but all they really are saying is, I don't want to invest in your business. Every, everything, like all the other reasons they actually give you are excuses, right? The, the, real, the real message underneath that, you have to live within 10 miles of Silicon Valley, we only invest in crypto, uh, you know, we like young founders, we need a company with co-founders, or we need a company with a sole founder, or... You know, how does this, how is this going to scale? All those, all those are just different variants of no, right? Well, no, but, but by the way, yeah, I know, but they still think you are because every VC thinks you're looking for money because that gives us a reason to exist, right? Um, but the beauty is, it turns out, even if you are looking for money, is that you can have a million no's, all you need is one yes, right? And so, you know, the, the, the thing that I advise entrepreneurs when I advise them is not to try to convince investors who have passed on you to invest. They don't want to invest in you, and they've given you some good or bullshit reason for that. It's to go seek the person who you want as a, as a partner, and that person, when they're going to meet your business, is going to be like so excited about your business that even though you're not looking for money, is going to convince you to take their money because they're going to be more excited about your business than you are. And sometimes you meet those people, and it's an incredible experience. I've been, like, I've, I've pitched some VCs who've turned around and pitched me, like, g more grand visions for businesses that I started. I'm like, wow, like, you should be running this. This is amazing. And, and you know, if you find a true partner there, that you, you'll, you'll get that resonance. And if you don't, then it's, like, it's probably the wrong person. Um, now, the more kind of, like, strategic question of, like, what does venture look like over the next, you know, two centuries? Um, you know, I don't know. Like, there's, there's proof points of alternative models already working from equity crowdfunding, companies like AngelList or CircleUp or, uh, you know, Republic, et cetera, that are using kind of like Jobs Act, grounds up models to, to fundraise. Um, there are angel networks. I mean, there's, there's, I think, 700 plus new seed funds were started this year. Most of them are one or two person operator groups fairly distributed, a lot of them in Silicon Valley, but fairly distributed, so there's new sources of capital from, from basically funds kind of coming out of nowhere. Um, but if you look at the market data, like the majority of the returns are still driven by like a handful of well-known branded investors who everybody wants to work with because they have a proven track record of having helped those companies get big. And so I don't think those guys go away because, you know, IBM and Microsoft haven't gone away in tech because they've proven over long durations that they're actually helpful to you know, whoever buys their product. Same thing for Sequoia Benchmark, et cetera. Um, I think the kind of middle of the funds, some will pop up, some will die. Alternative vehicles will, will exist. Maybe at some point AI will just pick you know, for us so we so take the human aspect completely out of it. Who knows? Um, but I think, you know, th there's a lot of trends, like big, big funds are moving downstream, small funds are moving upstream, like which one will stick is TBD. Um, but, but I think, you know, at the, it, it kind of doesn't matter, right? Like at the micro level, it just comes back to like, find a partner who's patient, who likes you, who will be a good partner for you on the long haul. And that the number of people that you need to actually bring a business to fruition is very small. Well, let's say, 